just uh, speaking in the prophetic and those type of things. Uh, but what we are going to do today is very prophetic. You can't hear me, can't you? I don't need no microphone. I didn't think I did. Uh, <laughs> praise God. Technology is wonderful. All the different yeah. Bible study tools you can get on your phone now. You can get on tablets. You can go old-fashioned and you can get your Strong's Concordance out and do the same thing. That's what we did for years and years and years. But uh, what we want to talk about are, is dreams today. And we want to talk about dreams from a scriptural point of view and uh, not necessarily from somebody's book, nothing against somebody's book, but we just like to go back to the real book. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And to understand what a dream is, uh, you know, you pretty much have to go back to the original language, and that's what I intend to do, is I, I intend to go back to the original language and give you the definition of the word dream and, uh, and talk about it. And of course, the word dream means to dream. But it comes from a root word that means to bind firmly. All right? Now, that's one of the things that we don't understand about dreams is a dream will get a grip on you. We know that from nightmares, for example. I had a nightmare when I was three years old and a spirit of fear came into my life and I dealt with that spirit of fear at about 1981 wow. when I was delivered from that spirit of fear. There are many spirits of fear. But that I remember the specific dream where that fear gripped me. And then go back years later and look and it means to bind firmly. And God created dreams so that He could speak to you and bind what He's ministering to your spirit. And of course, the enemy is a counterfeit, and he will try to take fear and bind it to you. Amen? Amen. I've had dreams I stood up to preach or to speak, and nothing would come out to make you intimidated when you get ready to speak. Amen? Mm -hmm. See, the enemy tries to bind to it. Is that all right? And uh, so we want to look at, uh, in the book of Job, I want to look at... Uh, a specific scripture since I get my fingers to turn. You know. In Job, this is uh, what it says uh, in Job 33, 15. It speaks of, of uh, 34, yeah, whatever, 33, 14. That's my word here. For God speaks once and yea twice, and yet man perceives it not. So God's speaking, but it says that men are not understanding, okay? That's pretty good there. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, in slumberings upon the bed. So here we have God speaking to men once or twice and them not perceiving it, not understanding it. Amen? Not understanding that God's speaking to us. We want to understand that dreams are like prophetic revelations. And God is speaking them not just to your mind, but to your spirit. Okay? Am I getting too complicated? Everybody says I'm simple. They don't really know me. I, what the deal is, if you can take something very complicated and bring it down simply so you can understand it, that's called anointing. So we want to understand that dreams are like revelations. When you have a bad dream, it's the devil's revelation for you. It's the devil's prophetic utterance over you. He's prophesying failure, fear, defeat over you. Trying to bind you to that vision of failure. Amen? And now we have God coming along who created the process and He is trying to speak things of a godly sort over you to bind them to you on the inside whether you remember the dream when you wake up or... Amen? So... I want to read it again. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men and slumberings in and upon the bed, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction. Amen? He, he opens. I love that opens because that means to open. That means to, to bear things nude in the original. It means to strip away so that it can't hide behind a veil or behind a a curtain, or you, know, you actually, I just, it's so cool in Revelation, that's what Jesus, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. All of a sudden you see Him with hair like wool and eyes like fire. Amen? Amen. Oh. And you see the Antichrist to be who He really is, the beast. 
But He opens the ears of men and seals their understanding. That word seal means to close up. He takes godly knowledge and He imparts it and seals it up inside of someone. That's pretty good, isn't it? And we worry about remembering our dreams. It is important to remember your dreams if you can and to write them down. Especially if God tells you to get out of that bed and write that down. You better not say, oh, just tell me again in the morning. You better. Amen. Amen. Because He wants to seal our instruction on the inside, but He also wants to give you something in your mind to be able to do warfare with. Okay? And so it means to seal. He, he, it means to close up. He puts it in there and He seals it up. And it says He seals their instruction. Admonition. It's not just information. It can have, this is what you do with the information. Amen? Yeah. And the temptation day is to tell you a whole lot of dreams. And I may tell you some dreams. But I want you to understand that it's, that it's God that is giving these dreams. And uh, I will share one dream. This is not my dream. This was a lady's a dream. And it was, she had a dream. And she was, she'd come out of her house at the, on a farm. She'd come out and she looked. And there were rescue vehicles and fire trucks and all this stuff all over her property. And couldn't figure out why. She didn't see any problem. She said in the dream she was going around the farm and gathering up her animals and trying to put her dogs in the back of the SUV and doing all these things. When she woke up from that dream, she said she didn't have any idea what it meant, but she felt like something supernatural had occurred. That's a ceiling of your understanding, amen, and of instruction. Almost a year later, she came out the door one morning and fire trucks were all over her property and rescue vehicles were everywhere and a wildfire was burning. And they, they was coming toward her property and they were making the line right there at her property. And she said, so she gathered up, she said she had peace and she gathered up her animals and said just as she was putting her dogs in the SUV, it dawned on her that she'd had this exactly in a dream without the fire, without the sirens, without the smoke, without all the things to be afraid of. Amen? God had sealed her instruction. They didn't lose anything. They didn't lose anything. See, we think we've got to understand dreams right this minute. That's one of the things I'm going to go back and forth on. We run out and try to get someone to interpret our dreams when our dreams generally are from God. They will interpret themselves. Or God will interpret it for us. Some dreams are not for right now. Yes. You could have got 40 people tell her what they thought that dream meant. Yes. Good. Amen? Good. Yes. Instead of having patience that God sealed that instruction in her before the crisis. And that'll work. One of the things I noticed when I went back and started studying dreams was who was having the dreams. There we go. I forgot to turn mine on too. One of the things... I brought one and forgot to turn it on. Uh, one of the things I noticed was who was having the dreams. I looked, and I, I always you go to Genesis, because Genesis is where dreams, you know, everything, go to the root of Genesis, go to where it starts. And I got to noticing that it wasn't the godly people that were having the first dreams, it was the more or less ungodly. I got to noticing that people were having dreams, and I got to looking through the scripture, and it's the Nebuchadnezzar's that's having dreams. It's the Pharaohs that's having the dreams. It's the Abimelechs that we don't even know who that is. That was the one that took Abraham's wife and was going to put her in the harem and going, oh, you know, and, uh, and here is God giving ungodly people dreams. And whenever there was an interpretation to be given, it was usually God gave it to them or a godly person, a Christian, would come to help this ungodly person interpret their dream. But I didn't see hardly any evidence of a Christian receiving a dream and somebody else having to interpret it for him. And that stood out to me. And I started to look. And Abimelech, he has a dream. He's the first one we really have that has a dream. And God came to Abimelech, it says in Genesis 20 and verse 3, God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said unto him, Behold, you're but a dead man. Well, that's a pretty straightforward dream. <laughs> I rebuke you, Jesus. Now, that's what a Christian would have said. Abimelech said, Oh, dear Lord, for the woman which you have taken, she's a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her. And he told the Lord that. And he said, Lord, will you slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She's my sister. 
She even herself said, He's my brother in the integrity of my heart and innocence of my, hand, of my hands have I done this. And God said to him in a dream, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart and I withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I suffered you not to touch her. In other words, God gave him the dream to stop something that was going to be very bad. Amen? He's a ruler of a nation and God gave him a dream. Do you know we need some people to start to some more dreams? It's been a long time since Martin Luther King had a dream. We need Mr. Obama to have a dream, guys. I'm telling you. God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar so He can speak to Mr. Obama. He can speak to whoever comes in after Him. God is able to change nations because He speaks to rulers. He doesn't have to speak to a Christian to change things. He can speak to whoever He wants to. Amen? So I, so I started to notice those type things. And I started to notice that... Uh, there's so many people in the scriptures that he gave dreams to. And you go, dear Lord, did he do that when he did it? He gave Solomon dreams. He's a good king. Oh, praise God. Uh -oh. Of course, we know he gave Nebuchadnezzar dreams, don't we? Oh, where is Pharaoh? We know he gave Pharaoh dreams. Anyway, let's do Pharaoh here. We'll do Pharaoh. Everybody knows Pharaoh. we do Pharaoh. But everybody says, but Joseph had dreams. Yes, he did. Whew. He interpreted whose dream? Mm. Ain't that a good word, though? Yes. Well, I, I don't know how exactly I want to do that, but I'll do it right quick. And, and Genesis 37, 5, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Amen? Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. And, 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 he, and he, he said, here, here, this is the dream which I have dreamed. For we were binding sheaves in a field, and my sheaf arose and stood upright, and your sheaves stood around about me, and obstinate to my sheaf. Notice they're binding there. And a dream means to bind it to you. They never forgot his dream. Mm -hmm. That's right. They did their best to put his dream out. Mm -hmm. But a real dream has got a binding effect. It stays with you. It's, and his brethren said, Will you indeed reign over us and have dominion over us? Yes. <laughs> and they hated him more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed another dream. And he told his brethren, said, Behold, I dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made up, up sense to me. And he told it to his father and his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brethren come and bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed that saying. That word observe means to guard, to hedge about as with thorns. It's one of the scriptures that's used of, uh, about Joshua that you're supposed to meditate on the word and observe to do. So we think observe means one thing. In the New Testament it says to guard. Uh, we use that word over there, the same, uh, the same type when we say it, that he that keeps the word. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen? To keep his commandments. And we think that means to do perfectly. No, it means to guard. It means to hedge about what God has said as with a hedge. And let nothing take what God has said from you. Amen? It doesn't mean I can do all this right, but I sure can't give in to society and the world trying to dictate to me what is right. I have to guard what God has said. I have to keep His commandments. I have to observe what He says. Amen? Even if I can't do all that He says all the time, thank God there is grace, but I will not surrender what He has said because of my inability to perform. Amen? So I'm guarding. The, and so it says right here that the brethren envied him, but his father, what did he do? His father hedged that about and guarded that. Why? Because that said that Joseph had a future. And that's one of the things that hurt Jacob so bad when he thought Joseph was dead that his dream had died. But that dream was stronger than, it was stronger than Jacob's perception of whether or not Joseph was living. That's, right. That's a big word. Mm -hmm. 
the dream that God gives you is stronger than the perception of whether it's coming to pass. The reality of the dream brings it to pass. That's a powerful word. He protected. He attended to it. He thought about it. Why is that so? Because Jacob knew what dreams did. He had his own dream and seen angels, what? Ascending and descending, didn't he? Didn't he? Over there working for old Laban, he had dreams about it and God spoke specifically and told him uh, when the animals come and mate, you know, you put these color things up and they'll be striped, this will be that. And he wound up financially blessed because he followed in the daytime what God had ministered to him in the nighttime. Yes. Amen? That's, right. That's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? Yes. Yes. I tell you, once you start to see the value in the dreams God's given you, you won't be so quick to put the fire out of somebody else's dream. Amen? A dream equals prophecy sometimes. And just like there's false prophets, there are true prophets. Oh. But now let me, let me tell you this right here. Let me, let me get over here to... Uh, oh, I've got to go to the prison here. Let's go to the prison and minister to Joseph in the prison here. Let's see, might be about uh, uh, Genesis 40 and verse 5. And this is the butler and the uh, baker. And uh, they're both in the prison. Of course, Joseph works there, doesn't he? Yeah. He's in charge of it, isn't he? Yeah. You think you're in prison and God's put you in charge of your prison. <laughs> I'm telling you what, you just don't know. Uh, and, and both of them dreamed a dream. Both of them, each one, dreamed a dream in one night. Each man according to the interpretation of the dream. And the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt were bound in prison. And the word interpretation means to open up. To open it up is what that word will mean in a minute. And Joseph came into them in the morning and looked upon them. And behold, they were sad. They weren't happy. Isn't that funny? I'd have been unhappy just been in the prison. I'd have been unhappy to wonder if I was going to live tomorrow. And they're depressed about these dreams. Why are they depressed about them? Because they felt like something was imparted to them, but they couldn't get a grip on it. Same thing going to happen to Pharaoh a little bit. Amen. Amen. And they, they looked and he said, well, why do you look so sad? And they said, we have dreamed a dream and there's no interpreter. And Joseph said, this is what Joseph said, interpretations belong to God. That's a big word. I'm supposed to tell you that this morning. Interpretations don't belong to a book that says in dreams, the woman always means this and the man always means that and such and such always means this. No, interpretations belong to God. They belong to God. That's what the same thing Daniel said over there. Uh, we'll go pray. And God will give us the interpretation. Amen? Trouble was, you had to tell them the dream and the interpretation. How come? Because it was lots of quacks that would just try to tell you what something means because you won't know no way. Why were they sad? There were no astrologers or no gazers in the prison to explain to them what their dream was. If they were out there in Pharaoh's court, they'd have had no trouble finding an interpreter. Because, man, there's lots of them folks out there. But here they were stuck in here by themselves. We can't call the psychic. What are we going to do? <laughs> Lord, behold, Joseph's in there. He's got some experience with dreaming some dreams that don't seem like they're coming to pass. Amen? But he said the interpretation or the opening up. Remember I told you that's what the word meant. The opening up. Think about it this way. God gives you a dream. He gives you a prophetic thing on the inside over you. He's the one that opens it up. He explains it, but He opens it up and brings it out on the outside. He's the one that makes it manifest. Amen. He's the one that makes it to manifest. And it says, this is there. So it says, interpretations belong to God. So they, He said, tell them the dream. They told them the dream. He interpreted the dreams. One of them... Great interpretation. He's going to be back with Pharaoh, going to be good. And then sees the good interpretation. He says, well, interpret mine. <laughs> oh, yours means you're going to have your, you know, you're going to be hung on the pole and going to cut your head off and birds going to eat your head. Well, okay. <laughs> That's why I don't, it's all right. I, I just do not know. 
And, 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 and of course, Joseph says, now, you remember me when you get back to Pharaoh. Well, he ain't going to make no waves when he gets back to Pharaoh. I'm talking about nobody in prison over here. So he kind of lets it slide until Pharaoh starts having some dreams. Amen? And Pharaoh has a dream. And when Pharaoh has a dream, suddenly they're looking for somebody to interpret. And guess who they find? And, and then what happens? Joseph's dream is opened up, fulfilled, and he winds up ruling in Egypt, doesn't he? Yeah. Including his brethren. Including those other things. Now, I just want to back up just a little bit here. I don't want to wear you out. I just want you to see that God is using dreams all through the Scripture. He gives, uh, when Gideon is doing his fleeces, remember Gideon and his fleeces, Angel says, you're a mighty man of God. And he said, well, if this and if that and if the other, you know, I want it wet, then I want it dry, then I want it wet, then I want it dry, and then, then we go through the people drinking, get rid of that many. Everybody's afraid, go home. Dear Lord, don't ever ask nobody afraid. Don't ask them if they're tired. Whole church be empty if you ask. All the tired people can go home. Oh, we don't want to do that. He's over there having the back door revival. And yet then God tells him, go on down and go to the enemy camp. And he goes down there and he listens. And here's one of the enemy has this dream where this... I think it's a barley loaf of bread comes rolling down a thing and destroys all the tents and the other one interprets it and says, that's nothing more than the sword of Gideon. Why does he even know who Gideon is? Amen. See how God's causing the interpretation. Amen. See the deal. Uh, and uh, New Testament, there's not much dreams going on. And, I'll, and, and I, what I'm going to mean that, I'm going to read you the scripture. And it says in Acts uh, 2 17, and it'll come to pass in the last days. Now, them last days, them last days are the farthest away days. Are we living in the last days? We're definitely close, are we not? Yeah. It'll come to pass in those days, says God, that I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And I got to read the rest of it. And on my, ser on my servants, on my handmaids, on my servants and on my handmaids, I'll pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy and I'll show wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke and you know, some more stuff, good stuff. But I want to come back up to the dreams for a minute. In the New Testament, we see that part of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit is dreams and prophecy. Amen? Visions, prophecy, dreams. Is that okay? Oh, it is to me. I love it because I got to looking in the original words, and I don't know how old you are, but, you know, I started to have more dreams than I used to have. I started to have more dreams in the last five or ten years than I ever had. And I mean, I have prophetic dreams nearly continually. I don't try to have prophetic dreams. I have prophetic dreams. I have dreams about stuff and God says, pray that don't happen. And I don't have any trouble praying that don't happen. Because I seen it. Amen. And you know, I, you know, oh. yeah. I'm telling you. There's, there's, but I want you to know that word old there don't mean ancient. It just means an elder. It's, it's presbytery. It's just like an elder in the church. In other words, you don't got to be a hundred. And so I went to look at the young word just for meanness to see it. But see, you're young men. It says right there, uh, under 40. Y'all are younger than y'all thought y'all was. I'm still old, but y'all are younger than y'all thought y'all Under 40. Well, the Bible's got a different definition of youth than the world has. But I want you to see that it says your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. And to see means you see things. That's pretty simple. Vision is anything that you can gaze upon and look at. And of course dreams are basically a vision that you have while you're asleep. Now there are some false people out there always going to be there are always going to be some false people out there dreaming dreams. They're dreaming the world's ending tomorrow and you need to sell all your stuff. Don't get hung up on their dream. Amen? Deuteronomy 13, 1 says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams. Notice how God puts it in the same category. 
which gives you a sign or a wonder. And the sign or wonder come to pass. Now see, most people think the proof of a prophetic thing is whether it happens. It's not. It's not scriptural. False prophets can prophesy things and they come to pass. Empty most charismatic churches out on the ground right there. Oh, because I thought, well, if he said it and it happened, it has to be God. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have just be. How do you think the Antichrist is going to deceive all these people? You know, you call some fire down out of heaven, man. You can grow a big crowd. But if there arise a prophet among you or a dreamer of dreams and give you a sign or a wonder and the sign and wonder come to pass whereof he spoke to you saying and let us go after other gods which you have not known and serve them. It's their message you judge it by not by whether it comes to pass. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. And you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice, serve Him and cleave to Him. And if that prophet or dreamer of dreams, he should be put to death because he tried to turn you away from the Lord your God. And we're not talking about killing somebody. We're saying when somebody volunteers to help you get in touch with your dead relatives, they're not doing you a blessing. Amen. Somebody offered that to my girl. She told me on the phone yesterday. Somebody she works with said, come on over to the house. I got a new Ouija board. We'll get a hold of your daddy. He's been dead two years. We'll just talk to him. She said, no, I don't think so. I go to church. Well, thank God you go to church. But you ain't going to talk to your daddy. No way you're going to talk to a faith imitation. Amen. Just because he gives you goosebumps doesn't mean it's God. Oh. Just because it gives you goosebumps doesn't mean it's... Man, that's the truth. Oh. There's another category of dreams. I don't know if I can pop it up for you. I think I can pop it up for you. This is one that... Uh, Jeremiah 29.8. Everybody knows Jeremiah 29.11, don't we? Yeah. I have plans for you. I know the thoughts I think towards you. The good things, good things. Well, praise God. It's on the wall out there even. Yeah. But very few people know <laughs> Jeremiah 29.8. Now I want you to notice how he's describing this and realize, and it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets or your diviners that be in the midst of you, notice, diviners, mm, deceive you, neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. There are dreams that you can cause to be dreamed. You can think about something long enough till you dream about it. We know that's so in the natural. I've dreamed I was working and I couldn't even get up out of bed to go to work till I got what I was working on done. Now you've cleaned too many cars when you're dreaming of working all night long and you can't even get out of bed because you ain't finished the one that's got to be done so you can get up. Amen? You can study the book of Revelation so long you have dreams about it don't mean they're from God. Uh, I'm going to tell it. You can study about the rapture so much that you dream of the rapture. Amen? You, you, can, you can be afraid of stuff, the end of the world and the tribulation so much that you dream about it. You can cause yourself to dream about stuff. Quit. Don't overdo it. God's able to speak to you out of the blue about stuff. He doesn't have to give you what you're studying. Amen? I remember my first rapture dream. I hope it's my only one, but I do remember it very vividly because I, was, I wasn't raised in church, so I didn't know what the rapture was. And everybody, they'd tell you all about it like they knew all about it. And I'd look in the Scriptures and couldn't find all they was describing to me. You've got to take this verse and that verse and this verse and look between this verse and read between the lines over here go over here and stand just right in the sun in the shadow hit just right there to understand what they're talking about. And that's the truth. Jesus is coming back. Yes, 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 yes. So I had this dream. And here he is. And I heard the voice. And we all went up through there. I was flying through there. And Kenneth Copeland was over there. And somebody was over here. And all these ministries was flying up around me. And you know what our conversation was all the way up? It wasn't how wonderful Jesus was. It was, we were exactly right. We knew this is exactly how it was going to happen. <laughs> And then I had, then I, then it just came to so clear, sealed my instruction. We don't know nothing yet as we ought. Mm -hmm. 
Then I started noticing the Old Testament, they thought they knew everything about the first coming. <laughs> they missed it. They knew all the scriptures. But it didn't work exactly what they thought. You're going to have to have your ears open in these last days. God's going to give dreams and revelations that will spare your life and will take care of your whole situation. But you're going to have to trust Him. Somebody one time, and this is one of them things people do, he had this dream. A real good friend with just been charismatic things, hadn't been in long, he had this dream. And in this dream, uh, uh, God called him to do something and and he wouldn't tell me the dream. He said, I said, well, he says, I want to know what it means. I said, well, how are you supposed to know what it means if you, if you won't tell me what it is? Sound like Nebuchadnezzar and some of them people, doesn't it? So I thought, all right, Lord, if you want me to know, you're going to have to just, you have to show me what it is. And I had this dream. And this dream, I saw him walking down this road and saw explosions going off in the distance and battle-like stuff. And he was walking down this road, getting ready to go over the top of this a stone bridge and behind him was a ragtag looking bunch of people following you know that looked like they'd been through some things and right at the bottom of it it said leading God's people through tribulation that's all it said one line and so I told him I said I don't know what it means all I seen was going over this bridge with these people behind you leading God's people through tribulation and he said well that's the dream there was no more to it when he said it was a great big dream, I thought it went on and on and on. And no, it was just, it was big to him. God had impressed that in him. But we were so in touch with the end time events, the word tribulation, that it sounded like leading people through the great tribulation. And tribulation is pressure and stress. And boy, that's what all pastors do, is lead people on a narrow road with explosions going all around them through tribulation. That's the truth. That's the truth. And they're raggedy looking sometimes. They've been hit a few times and wounded a few times. See, we don't always understand. Sometimes somebody can see something prophetically for you. Because we're going to swap in and out of dreams there. Some dreams your eyes are open, some they're not. Some people have dreams for you. Uh, sometimes you have the dream and they interpret it for you. I dreamed one time that I was standing in prison. I was in line. There was a whole line of prisoners. I had my outfit on and my number. And I was standing beside a big time Christian evangelist. And me and him were praying for people as they went through the line. Ministering in prison. I made a mistake of telling that in church. And my pastor's wife said, you have a prison ministry. Brought such fear, condemnation, and heaviness on me. I was so afraid she was right. I mean, it is... Oh. It turns out I did have a prison ministry. If she said that, I couldn't get away from it. And God made it up and I learned to preach in the prison. That's where I learned to preach. But I was not an inmate. That's what I didn't like about the prison. <laughs> Praise God. I, see, I, I'm basic. I look in the New Testament and I'll say, where is prison ministries in there? Well, they was from the inside. Oh, there won't be no prison ministry. There wasn't no place I wanted to be. And... But, you know, but God, He took me over a period of time and He showed me all the negative things that'd be about it. Start with church people wouldn't know it. Nobody would know if you, that you was anointed. And all these things, that's big stuff to preachers. People, you want your gift to be known. Your relatives don't even believe you're saved. They're not going to know. And He's right. They didn't. And it worked out well, you know. And, uh, but, uh, so He set me up on that. He set me up and I finally told Him I would. And all the pressure left. And I thought, man, that was just a test. <laughs> Six months later, I met somebody uh, working up on the edge of a church building. I think we was painting the trim. And uh, he was hanging off on a rope on a ladder, and I was up there proving I wasn't afraid of heights. I was a lot younger then. I don't got to prove nobody I ain't afraid of nothing no more. I tell you what, I learned what the words mean in the, in the original language. You know what David said? He said, when I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. Amen. Amen. I didn't understand what trust was. In the Hebrew language, trust means to run to. I know where I run when I'm afraid. That's right. yeah. I've been trying to impress God and impress the devil for years by how much I trust when trust just means who do you run to. Amen. And I know who I run to. Right. I can shake like a leaf and run to Jesus. Right. Amen. Amen. Amen? There's something to that, isn't there? Yes. Just understanding what... That's why it says to study and show yourself. It ain't to prove to everybody else. Show yourself what it means. Because once you find out what it means, you feel better. 
Amen. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I wound up up there and I met him and I didn't know that I was stuck till the first time I heard him teach Sunday school. And he said, by the way, I minister in the prison. As soon as he said that, I felt this steel trap go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was there. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and he set me up to go to the prison and showed out he couldn't get there and I was just supposed to observe and I wound up doing the meeting by myself. First time I went in the prison, I ministered by myself and had 12, 14 people got saved. Amen. You know, Amen. and the devil discounted that for years because he said, well, they really didn't mean it. <laughs> so you got to listen to those things. Amen. Well, you know, well, where's all them people at that service last week? Well, I guess they really didn't get nothing because they're not back this week. Now, it usually means it's really good service and the devil fought it hard all week to keep them from ever coming back because he don't want yeah. good day. But let me tell you the truth about that drink. The truth about that dream and the interpretation all the way in about 2000 and maybe 8 or 9, God gave me the interpretation of that original dream. I ministered to prison for a year and a half. That was God. But that wasn't the dream. The dream was that I was in a prisoner's outfit ministering to other prisoners because even though I was held captive by things, I was still ministering Jesus to other captive people. That's what the church is. Yes, exactly. Fellow prisoners Good with man. an anointing of God. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yes. Set free by the blood of Jesus. Yes. But I thought I went through my prison ministry phase and graduated to good people. <laughs> Amen? No, no, I see God has shown me that was the type for my whole ministry. It's a hidden ministry. It's not a flashy ministry. It's ministering to people that nobody else cares about. Ain't you glad he cares about you though? That's right. Uh, I, I'll try to share a couple of things quickly. Somebody had a prophecy, kind of, I see at church one night. Just walked by, we was praying for people. And he said, I see you. I see you standing there in a suit, holding a baby in your arms and a little girl holding on to your pant leg. You know, and so you start to interpret that, you know. And he says, I don't know what that means. Well, thank God I try to train people, right? If you don't know what it means, <laughs> say what you see and let God tell them what it means. Because it didn't, and I thought, well, I think I know what that means. That means we're still going to have our promised child someday. May have an extra little girl, or maybe we lost a little girl along the way that we don't know about when we've got a little girl in heaven to go with you. <laughs> Amen? Let's read three books and call four people. And see what I said by saying it means, you know. And instead, I didn't know nothing about it. So that night, that was a Wednesday night. That night at 3.30 in the morning or so, I don't know what time it was exactly. I got it wrote down on my notes. God woke me up and said, if you'll get up and go pray, I'll tell you what it means. Well, it tells me two things. I don't know what it means. <laughs> Amen? And if I want to know, I'm going to have to get us. He told me go in the sanctuary. Go get up, go in the sanctuary, and pray, and I'll show you what it means. He told me that three times because I'm still bargaining with him. Can't you just tell me what it means laying here? <laughs> no, he said, I want you to write it down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. So finally I drug out of bed and went in there, and I realized that I'd prophesied over somebody that same Wednesday night that God was going to start waking them up about 3 30 in the morning. And when he woke them up to get up and write down whatever he said, that's funny. So now he's, he's <laughs> That's funny, I think. And got in there and God explained the whole thing. He said, it's faith of a child. My wife's the little girl holding on to my pant leg. And I've been trying to get her to grow up and be this mighty woman of God all these years. And God's happy with her having faith of a child. Amen. Amen. Now see, God does things different than we see things. That it don't take huge amounts of faith. You can, just, you can go through, you can just hang on for dear life and still make it. Amen. He started showing me all kinds of things and it changed how I look at things. Dreams. Had a dream when she was, uh, she was losing weight and you know having a little health issues there for a while. And I had this dream. And in this dream, I, we were going from meeting to meeting to meeting. We were going away from this healing meeting, going to another healing meeting, going to another healing meeting. With, and I was taking her and was trying to get to a Benny Hinn crusade. And she just got weaker and weaker and weaker. So I was having to pick her up and carry her from meeting to meeting. And I was so angry. But I, but I was angry at her because she wasn't resisting this sickness. Dream. And, you know, in the dream, it's, it's 
huge amounts of anger. I can't just, because in dreams, you know, you're in dreams. In dreams, you can do anything you want. No, you can't either. But you know what I mean? They just take on their own sometimes. And when I woke up, God ministered to me. And what he ministered to me was that, that I needed to be as angry as at the, at the devil and at what was trying to take her from me as, instead of being angry at who the problem Good was Good in. Good you know, and she lost 50 pounds during that period of time. But she couldn't see she was losing weight. Turned out she had cancer. Mm-hmm. See, the devil was trying to make me mad at her for not having enough. Faith. Devil ever made you mad at yourself for not having enough faith? faith? Yes. Good see what I'm saying there? Yes. So God uses, seals your instruction. He spoke to me early and told me when she had cancer. He said she had cancer and told me that it had spread. He told me everything about it. He told me she, in three years she'd be better than she ever was. Of course, I didn't tell her all that, but he said, write it down exactly like I told you. I thought maybe I'd have to have it in the next three years. <laughs> Amen? Amen? See, God does these things. I didn't tell her. I let her go to the doctor and talk to the doctor and do all that kind of things. And, and you know, But when it was all said and done, the doctor was absolutely, exactly right. Dreams. If you can see yourself doing something in a dream, it's easier to do it in real life. God knows that. The devil knows that. Notice how that seal in the instruction is. You can have this dream and, you know, and it's a sinful thing and it's so much easier to do that sinful thing once you get out here That's in the daylight. Right. It's an assignment sent from the devil. God told me this week, gave me a dream and he gave me a list of things. I didn't know I was going to do dreams. But he said, don't make decisions in dreams that you wouldn't make in real life. Do not make decisions. If you make decisions in dreams that you wouldn't make in real life, you're opening yourself up. You're opening yourself up to live that out in the daytime. It's so much easier to make that decision to be critical or to be angry or to be uh, lustful or whatever the dream might be because you can just have this dream that you're angry at somebody at church. That you're just foaming angry and you need to make the right decisions even in your dreams. You can't always control dreams, but you can... He said, be careful, the devil's trying to get you to make that decision. Because you can see yourself doing it. Boy, that's a dream. God gives dreams where you can see yourself doing things. I had a series of dreams uh, back in about 1987, and, and during that year I had ten dreams. Just about, just I think it were 10 dreams. And in each dream I would dream, and one of them I remember that I was a youth minister. And it was just the most marvelous thing. I just felt the peace of God and the presence of God and just knew this was what I was supposed to do. So I'd wake up from the dream and I'd go, wow, I've got this, I'm going to be in the youth ministry, you know. And, uh, and then I'd have another dream. And that dream there, I think I had moved all the way to New York State and was right up by the Canadian border and was pastoring a church there, and it was the most marvelous thing in the universe. I mean, it was God. Then another one I was meeting in an upper room at a Catholic church with Catholic people, ministering the Word of God. And that was the most wonderful thing. And each of them had the common thread of that it was I was in the center of God's will, and I was doing exactly what I was supposed to do. Amen? So after I got tired of chasing down this and chasing down that and looking on the map to find the exact physical location of where the place was in New York, which I found, amen? Amen. Turns out that God was just trying to minister to me that wherever I was and whatever He was speaking to me and whatever He had me doing at that moment in life was the absolute center of His will and the most perfect place for me to be. And I could rest... And be fulfilled in that, not chasing a destiny somewhere. Amen. 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 And I was a part of a big church, and God told me to leave, and He'd give me a church. And that was a stressful situation because it was a year and a half before I got a church. And, and so I'm looking at all these things, and God gave me a dream one night, and He said, your church will have ten rooms. So I went around and I looked for church buildings with ten. Every place I'd visit, I'd count the, got any hidden rooms upstairs? I see nine. Is this all? You got twelve. That ain't it. There ain't nobody else like me, is it? And we looking and we looking and we looking. And it was just, I think, last year that God showed me that the ten dreams over being in His will and the ten rooms were the same thing. They were, the, they were just the same dream doubles. 
Isn't it funny? That that church wasn't a building with ten rooms. It was your ministry to Him doing whatever. Boy, I've done all the things nearly in that dreams down through the years. Dreams. We don't want to get too hung up in the dreams. We don't want to get too hung up in the other things. But we want to understand that in the New Testament, I couldn't find a single place where somebody went to somebody else to get the dream interpreted. The same Holy Spirit that gives you the dream is able to open it up for you. Amen. 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 Now there's tongues and interpretations and there's prophecies and there's things, but God gave you the dream. And people constantly, because I talk about dreams, want me to interpret their dreams. God gave it to you. If He gave, if he gave it to me to give to you, that'd be different. And He does do that. I have dreams for people. Relatives. Now I'll call them and they think, you call them at 5 o'clock in the morning and tell them you had this dream or not. They're like, oh, it's who died. It's not important to them. It is important. You have a dream that i uh, got a niece named Destiny and God said that she was dying. That her destiny was dying. That my brother needed to show her love and attention. Amen. This was seven or eight years ago. So now she's out every which way, every which way, pregnant, everything all messed up. And they can't figure out what happened. What happened was God gave you a dream seven years ago to nip that thing in the bud. Amen. Yeah. You got to nip it. And her name's Destiny. It's the devil's trying to rob her destiny. Come on. The destiny. It's you got to understand that we don't always understand the dream and we want to know the details. What does that detail mean? And God's trying to say, no, I'm sealing your instruction on the oh, inside God. and I'm binding it to you so it'll, it'll, it'll survive hell and high water so that when you get to the place where the interpretation is there, I can let you know that this is what it was. I've got to tell you two dreams. Uh, I'll tell you the uh, easy one first. The easy one is... Uh, I had this dream several years ago, maybe two or three years ago, and I was preaching in this Pentecostal church. That's big for me because, you know, I teach. They were loud. But here I was doing a teaching message loudly. I saw myself do it. I know I can do it. I seen myself do it. And so here it is. And when it got done, I was able to go from screaming, which is what I call it, from screaming, because that was loud, screaming down to being able to minister like I minister, which is hard to swap the two. Yes. And uh, saw the people in the pews and the chairs and saw that person and pray this, pray this, pray this. It's a great dream. I woke up going, well, praise God. I know I can preach in the Pentecost church now if I have to. Because God said if they invite you, come. Whoever invites you, that's where you go. So, year goes by. We close one of our buildings down and uh, we give our pews away. God said, sow all the church stuff. So we sowed the stuff. We didn't put it in storage to wait for a new plant. We sowed it. And we gave the pews away. And uh, we had a lot of people wanting pews. We wanted to give them as, a, as, you know, to be used again, not to go sit on somebody's porch and get rained on. And uh, so this, this Pentecostal preacher called me and we done gave all the pews away and he you know, and we could just, you could just sell, we just liked each other. Something in the spirit. We just something there. You know, he's like 80 years old. And, and but you could just feel something's there. And he called me back two or three times on the impuse because people kept telling him at work that it's still on Craigslist. Well, they're gone. We got talking. He said, well, I'm going to invite you down to minister. We're going to, when we get to the fellowship hall fixed, we're going to have you down. Okay, I'll come. And all this kind of stuff. Didn't think no more about it. And finally, he did call me back and said, can you come? I said, okay, I'll come. And it's way out from yonder. So we go way out from yonder. Little bitty old building with a single wide trailer attached on the side of it there. That's the fellowship hall. I felt right at home. I really did. And we went out there and uh, somebody went with me and wore shorts. I knew that wasn't a good idea. But they didn't throw stones at him. They let him in. During the prayer things, he fell over and knocked out a whole people. <laughs> they like that. I got up there. I ministered my message on uh, on what I was already going to preach, and it came out. It was loud, which is fine because sometimes you have to be loud. You know, you got to hold their attention. And and so we do all that, and then we got down and asked, "Could I pray for people?" Only when I looked out at the crowd and started to pray for the first person did I realize it was exactly the building, exactly the place, exactly the person. The person beside them was the person. Beside them was the person. Beside that one was the person. It was all those same people. 
I didn't have to have all the understanding about the dream a year before. It was just God showing that I know what I'm doing. Adding and multiplying. I was supposed to go across there. Some people would pray for added, some multiplied. Adding, multiplying. I knew exactly which person, which person, which person. Because I saw it a year before in a dream. But I didn't spend the whole year in between trying to analyze the paralysis of analysis. Don't worry. If God give it to you, He can interpret it. Amen? Amen? Amen. Sometimes the interpretation, that's what I told you, is the opening up when you see it and go, wow, I dreamed this. God's been here a year before me. Amen? A lot of people healed and things that night. God moved. Amen. I mean, they did. They, was, they just cranked up and going. Uh, I'll share one last dream, I think. And there's dreams everywhere. I have dreams about the president. I have dreams about this. I have dreams about all kinds of stuff. God is constantly giving dreams. It's hard to be angry at somebody that God says he loves. I mean, it's just real difficult. <laughs> and then you go reading that who's having them God dreams is uh, world leaders. They got all kinds of astrologers and advisors, but still can't understand what they ought to do. Jesus. I'm telling you, God can give them some dreams. Amen. He can turn their heart. Amen. Oh, He can do all kinds of good things. Listen, here's a personal dream, and I'll share it, and we're going to stop. <coughs> I had this dream uh, when I first started getting delivered from a lot of demons and stuff in 2000 and so. It was a big period of time in my life where God was just delivering of a whole lot of stuff. And, uh, Thank you. And, and that's good. It always is good. Amen. It's always there, but you didn't know they was there. <laughs> Amen? And people think you're fine now. You don't know what's still there and what ain't there. That's the honest truth. When God deals with them, deal with them. Don't go dig everything up by yourself. You can't do nothing with it. No how. We were talking earlier when I first got here. I, I bought my first Christian album right over there by that stack of chairs. There was a Christian bookstore in here. And I bought it on super closeout. We were broke, and it was a double album for 90% off Don Francisco. I bought it because it had He's Alive on there. And found out, man, there's a whole lot better songs than that on that album. And, uh, but I remember, right over by a stack of chairs, I remember that that's where I, uh, where I bought that. And, and I remember that everybody was talking about the Jesus movement, talking about the charismatic movement, and all this kind of stuff. And it was all just as dead in here and as dead around here. And there's a music right here. I work right down the street. The Spirit of God had come in in revival, and people were able to do all kinds of stuff. And the wind of revival had moved out. And they were sitting here mad at each other and growling at each other. And all I got to see was what was left after revival left. Amen? Amen? That's why they're closing the bookstore. They're all upset and doing all them things. But the anointing was not here that was here when everything was going. The anointing covers a whole lot of management problems and people problems. So we need that and when the anointing moves to something else, we've got to move with it. Then God gives you dreams to help move you from one season of your life to the next. And, and this dream here, we had a... Uh, my niece come to live with us when she was three years old and stayed until she was about 16 and when she left she didn't leave in a happy mood. Very strifeful, very, 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 uh, I think we fought her tooth and nail from when she was three. And oh, just adopt a child. It'll be so happy and so sweet. Uh, you, better, you better listen to God. She needed a place, and God told me specifically when she was three, if you're doing it for her, then you go ahead. If you're doing it for you, you need to move on. And I, oh, Lord, we're doing it for her. Well, that was tested for a whole lot of years. God was right. Amen? Well, there's all kinds of things, rejection and stuff and spirits, and they get angry at the people that are there in their life and not the people that are not there. You know. And there's all kinds of stuff like that. But in the dream, I had this dream. And because I'd been coming through so much deliverance that I started, the Lord has ministered to me, that I need to realize, like I told you, a, a, a bad dream is a, is, a, is a false prophecy of evil over you. And you know what I said that earlier for? Here's the devil seeing you falling. The devil seeing you falling, 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 drowning. This, all these kind of dreams, right? Sitting, dreams, dreams, dreams. And so... I started to, by the Lord's help, to take authority over dreams in the middle of them. Amen. Amen. 
and just say, this ain't me. That's not, this is not my desire. This is not, this is not, mm, it's not my dream. Disown that dream. Well, this night I had this dream, and in this dream uh, I came into the house and went in her bedroom, and it's after she'd moved away. And there she was dead on the bed. She was dead. Been dead. A long time. And here I am having to call her daddy and tell her he's dead. She's dead, and she's wanting to know. He's wanting to know, well, what happened to her? I said, I don't know. She's just dead. She died in our house. She's dead in her bedroom. She's just dead. You know, and I'm trying to wake myself up from the dream. And it won't wake up. And the next thing I know, we're at the funeral home and we're having to explain to everybody and they uh, hadn't got her in the casket. They got her in this drawer. You can pull her out of the drawer and look, and there she is in that drawer. She's just as dead as dead. And I mean, all these emotions going on. Oh, I mean, and I'm trying to wake myself up, trying to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. You know what I mean? And you got all this going on, and in the dream, I'm just bawling and grieving over it. And in the dream, I do three things. I take this book, and I lay it in there with her. And I take this little thing, a little toy from when she was a kid, and I lay it in there. And one more thing that I can't see, and I lay it in there. And I go to push it back, and before I can push it back, she just sets up. She sets up, and she's all alive and smiling and just in love or hope. Not only is her body back, she's back. Well, she ain't never been that nice. You know what I mean? She is, you know what I mean? She's alive in more than one way. And now I'm glad I couldn't wake myself up. Amen? God's showing something. You know, and she gets out of the box and everything's and, and the things are restored. And so I didn't know what it meant, but I knew that that was something. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, in my mind, you know, well, what about the, the, the book? Well, the book the book's probably the Bible. It's got to be a Bible. I put a Bible in there. I got that. And that toy, you know, it's just a little toy she had when she's little. What was that other thing? And I never could figure out what the other thing was. Mm-hmm. Amen. But I'm still watching because now I know that she might look dead, but there's a resurrection oh, hey, coming. Amen. So. So, you know, things move along and, uh, you know, and uh, some different things happen and situations and, and uh, she wasn't married to who she was with and, you know, all these things go. So that makes it real stressful, especially if you're a pastor. Because <laughs> how, how do you, uh, don't, you don't want to approve of their sin, but you don't want to, uh, especially when they're mad at you anyway. They've been yeah. mad at you for years. And just because you breathe. And... Uh, <laughs> But God's got this thing going on. And one day I was working. And uh, one day I was working and uh, I had a convertible. Not the best convertible in the world, but it was my convertible. The only thing I've ever bought on purpose. That and a Volkswagen Beetle, which was a mistake. Uh, I still like that Beetle. It would leave you stranded. <laughs> Once a month. Twice a month. I mean, it was, But I liked it. Didn't make no difference. It didn't like me. And uh, but I had this convertible, and I, I I bought that convertible out of my extra money, not out of any any money that come out of bills, and paid on that thing for two or three years. Get that convertible paid for. Always wanted a convertible. Then I found out convertibles aren't no fun if you don't have hair. <laughs> you can only drive it at night. You find out why they put roofs on cars so you don't get heat stroke. I mean, it's hot in there. <laughs> Darn, you know, you don't want to put the roof up because you got a convertible so it'll be down. I like that car. And I, I, I did like that car. And I was out there one day and God spoke to me and He said while I was working, I wasn't even touching the car. He said, give that car to Angela. And I said, if I give it to her, boyfriend will drive it. Everything boyfriend drives tears up. But you can't just let them drive it because if you do that, then they'll run somebody over on your insurance. So you can't do that. If you give it to them, they'll go get a title loan. What can I do? You do what God says, and I gave it to her. Yes. Called her up and took the car out there to her and surprised her with it. Gave her the keys to it. The moment I handed her the keys, I burst out in tears. Didn't know why. I'm sitting there. I think it was in the Waffle House. It was at the Waffle House where she was working. 
I'm just bawling and can't stop bawling. She says, what's wrong? I said, honey, I don't know what's wrong. I don't got no idea what's wrong. But, uh, you know, I'm not who I used to be. Things like this happen to me now. God, this comes on me. I don't know why. Uh, you know, and uh, when I was leaving there, after we gave her the car and she's all bouncing and everything, as we drove away down the road on Woodbury Highway, it came as clear as anything. Those keys was what I put in that doggone coffin. The keys to that car was the third thing in that dream that I had placed in that coffin, in that drawer. I did not know that. I had I don't I don't know if I'd have if God wanted me to know it and be the reason that you do it to try to make it happen. All the way back I said, God, why am I crying? He says, Because you've opened the keys to her heart. That was the start of a huge transformation. She's in church now. She, she loves Jesus. She was sick, so she couldn't go to choir practice. So she's upset because she couldn't go to choir practice. She got a prophetic word Sunday that she was going to have a baby. That's big stuff in the Methodist church. They don't just go around giving out <laughs> prophetic words. I said, honey, that's God. She says, I know you prophesied that, but don't take it wrong. But you're... you're you know, you know. <laughs> I said, when did I prophesy that? She said, you said you had a dream. Oh. I said, so I have lots of dreams, honey. That's why I tell you when I have them, because I may not remember later. When did I have this? And she said, after my daddy died. So my brother's been dead two years. It's his daughter. And, uh, and uh, so we always had that issue that uh, she got a stepmother that told her that she couldn't love her father and love me. Mm. That it was disrespectful to her earthly oh. father. Oh, oh that's, the, that's the kind of stuff you find out stirring. God has restored that relationship. Yes. She may have died spiritually while she's in our house, but she's been raised up. Yes. Amen? Amen? And that, we could tell dreams all day and all night. And, 